Hello everyone! This lecture is about tooth enamel. We already have been talking a little bit about enamel when we discussed tooth development. And now our main topic is all about the structural features. And they are really very special. Dental enamel is the hardest substance the human body can produce. And it is a very complicated process. First, an enamel matrix is secreted. Then it is reabsorbed and mineralized, 98% of it. That is then really a quite solid inorganic material. And the cells that accomplish this masterpiece are the ameloblasts. How do they manage? And there are even more questions. Ultimately, tooth shape usually refers to the shape of the tooth crown. That's what it's peaking out of the gum. And the crown of the tooth is made of enamel. And how exactly do the ameloblasts create this shape? Special and different for each individual tooth, but the same on the right and on the left side of the oral cavity. So this lecture will be sort of thrilling, I hope. And I hope that you will share my excitement. As topics, or, if you like, as learning objectives, we want to create an understanding of the formation and special structure of dental enamel. And also, we want to explain how mineralization takes place. And at the end, you will also have knowledge of how the shape of the enamel mantle is created, whereby we also pay a particular attention to the internal structure of the enamel, that means the so-called enamel prisms. How are they arranged inside the enamel? And the structural characteristics of enamel are also closely related to this formative process. And these enamel prisms are ultimately the result of the mineralization of the enamel matrix. And of course, I'll always give a few clinical hints, so you will have a certain understanding about how enamel formation errors can also occur. And the enamel etching technique, which is so important and helpful for patients, is only possible because enamel has this prism structure. There are a lot of good textbooks on this topic. Here is a selection of examples and ultimately you can find all the content I address in this lecture, of course, all the pictures and the words in my textbook, Oral Structure and Biology, which is why I always include the page numbers on the top left hand corner. So now let us begin with dental enamel. As I said, the crown of the tooth is made of enamel. And this is what we see of the teeth when we look into the oral cavity. And normally, only the crown of the tooth looks out of the gums and only when our patients, or we ourselves, get significantly older, do the gums recede and parts of the root of the tooth become exposed. But this is then not made of enamel. We will discuss this in the lectures on the root of the tooth and on dental cementum. So enamel is definitely three to four millimeters thick at the cusps and towards the neck of the tooth it becomes thinner and thinner and then it really runs out very thinly, which is then less than a quarter of a millimeter. So that is only a few micrometers. And here in the picture, this is a very nice micro CT image from our colleague Anthony Olenzianek from the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig. And the enamel coating has been digitally detached from the dentine core and spread out in the middle so that you can see very clearly in the image what I have just described in relation to the thickness of the enamel mantle. Dental enamel is deposited in layers during its development, which takes at least nine months for deciduous teeth and several years for permanent teeth. And in this way, it is also like a diary. Everything that happens during its development, which has effects on the metabolism, 
leaves the traces in the body of the individual and then also in the dental enamel. And there it will stay forever. It is therefore possible to find a wide variety of enamel formation defects, all of which have a different pathogenesis. Here are a few examples. I have already described them in more detail in the video on tooth development, so here they are just meant as a reminder. However, we will also address different aspects now. At the top left you can see an example of fluorosis. In this case the matrix structure has been disrupted, probably due to damage of the amyloblast, and the crystals that have been deposited are positioned in a different way than normal, which is why the refraction of light is correspondingly different. The enamel then shows white spots or lines. It can also turn yellow or even brown discolorations can be seen. As far as I know, this is all related to the crystal arrangement. Fluoride itself is not yellow or brown. Now have a special look at the lines in the picture. You know from tooth development that there is a layer by layer growth of enamel. And if the fluoride damage only took place at a certain time during tooth development, then you can see these lines. This does not only apply to fluoride, other chemically analyzable or structurally recognizable changes can also be seen in enamel layer by layer, reflecting certain periods of time. From this, anthropologists can even trace the migration of prehistoric individuals if the geographical regions, then also in the drinking water, differs chemically from one to the other. So, dental enamel may become an important witness because of its structure. But there are also cases of fluoride damages where the enamel is totally crumbly, which is of course really bad for the patient. What else do we have? In the second picture, in the top row, you can see a narrowly circumscribed opaque discoloration of the enamel and at the same time a dislocation of the right central incisor. This tooth has already erupted, however, a bit into palatal direction. The medical history revealed, as I can still remember, that the child did hit the edge of a table and the father said it had been bleeding a lot and all the deciduous incisor teeth in the upper jaw were gone. Well, they were pushed and dislocated into the maxillary bone. This is quite possible. In this way, the root of the deciduous incisor may have come too close to the dental primordium of the permanent incisor and pressure itself, or indirectly, a local hematoma may have led to damage of the amyloblast in the exact region where we now see the enamel formation defect. And more precisely, the defect in the enamel structure that leads to these optical phenomena. The enamel itself, as touched with the probe, was normally hard. And in the image of the, uh, at the top right you can see an example of a very pronounced amylogenesis imperfecta. This is a genetic disorder in which the amyloblasts work incorrectly. The structure of the enamel matrix secreted by these diseased amyloblasts is then defective and the crystals cannot be properly arranged. And the two pictures in the lower row show an enamel disease that was only described towards the end of the last century. It is known as molar incisor hypomineralization, abbreviated as MIH. Initially, hypomineralized molars and incisors were described, hence this name. However, all other teeth can also be affected. I have also seen this myself, as well as deciduous teeth, as shown in the second picture in the lower row. In any case, the manifestation is also very different here. It ranges from small, closely circumscribed visible optical changes in the enamel up to brown discoloration and crumbling of the enamel. We do not know exactly what this is related to, and the causes are still unknown. And as you can see, you can tell so much about tooth enamel just from these few pictures, and you can only comprehend it 
if you understand tooth development and the processes involved in enamel formation. I hope I can contribute to this with this lecture. It will help research in this field and hopefully one day it will also help the patients concerned. Let us take fluorosis again as an example. Here I have inserted three ameloblasts that have just secreted in matrix of enamel and the matrix is being filled with crystals. And this is indicated by these many short lines. And next to it, you can see some details of the processes involved in the deposition of crystallites and the breakdown of the enamel matrix. More details will follow later in this lecture. Here, we have investigated this experimentally with colleagues in San Francisco. In this publication, you can see how much fluoride damage to the ameloblast can affect the quality of dental enamel. Normal tooth enamel is represented in the mouse in the left column of the histological group of four, and on the right, the severely damaged dental enamel is seen when the function of the ameloblast is disrupted by an overdose of fluoride. Around the six months, we see the first formation of dental enamel. This is a beautiful sagittal section in which you can see the first enamel in the dental primordium at the tips. That is where the formation of the incisal edges begins. Incidentally, you can see two primordia in the upper jaw in the sectional plane. This is one of the central incisor and one of the lateral incisor. They are slightly offset from each other there, which is why both have been hit in the section plane. However, the first layer of enamel can only be deposited once a layer of dentine has formed underneath it. So at A, the ameloblasts, which have just formed a very thin layer of enamel, marked with E, and underneath the layer of dentin, D, which has been formed before. This has been done by the odontoblasts, of course, marked with O. And to the right, I have placed the, the right half of the same dental primordium after having separated both halves and, of course, processed in different ways under the scanning electron microscope. And the soft tissue is no longer there. You see the ameloblasts have been removed. And you can look directly at the enamel layer, which is more precisely the fetal surface and at the same time the enamel in the section surface at S and the dentine at D. And the pulp cavity at P is also empty. Because enamel and dentine are opposite to each other here, the dentino-enamel junction is fixed from the beginning on and it stays that way forever whereby the formation of the dentine progresses toward the pulp and the layering of the enamel outwards toward the future tooth surface. And by the way, the dentino enamel junction in humans is not smooth, but shows this wavy or jagged contour, which appears in the surface, in the right picture then, as many adjacent dents with raised edges. I will discuss the details of this scalloped surface in the lecture on dentine. Here is just a small detail to the dentino enamel junction. We find such peculiar structures which are called enamel spindles. And don't be surprised at this name. These are terms from the century before the last, when everyone probably still knew what a spindle was. Of course, these are not any kind of spindles in the technical sense. At most, they might look like spindles. In reality, these are odonoblast processes that protrude for a certain distance into the en enamel layer. And D is again dentin, and that is where they come from. And S, that's enamel. It is really not at all clear how they get into enamel, but I will give you more details on this peculiar structure in the lecture about dentin. Here we will first have a closer look at the fetal enamel surface. For this purpose, I had a part of the tooth from the seventh month under the scanning electron microscope, 
which shows the enamel formation. So the tooth bell with the ameloblast has been removed. And we are looking directly at the fetal enamel surface that has just been formed, as I said, in the seven months prenatally. This is a deciduous incisor in the lower jaw. And from this specimen, we now enlarge a portion, and then we see the impressions on the surface which are caused by the ameloblasts in the enamel structure, which was still sort of soft at that time. As you see, they all show different outlines. Some of them are hexagonal, others like a pentagon, and there are others which resemble a keyhole form, but there are also many of them which are just only oval or even sort of roundish. So what we see is quite an abundance of so many different outlines on the fetal enamel surface. We will address this problem a bit later in this lecture. This is something like a more typical outline. But here we can also see the ameloblasts themselves. In the left picture at the upper edge, they are all lined up next to each other. Further down, you can see some individual ameloblasts and their impressions, which they have just left in the still soft enamel matrix. And here is a schematic representation of a dental primordium that is in the process of producing enamel. This is sort of a snapshot of a process that actually changes continuously. And the inner and the outer enamel epithelium are shown in red, and together they both enclose the stratum reticulare. And the numbers on the right of the diagram refer to the inner enamel epithelium, in which the ameloblasts show different stages of maturation. We can see which different stages of maturation these are in the diagram, which I will expand step by step in a moment. So it starts with one, which is a still undifferentiated epithelial cell in the inner enamel epithelium. It is located at the edge of the tooth bell, naturally due to its still premature state. And at two, the epithelial cell has become somewhat longer and is preparing itself to synthesize a lot of protein in the near future. This can be seen from the fact that the number of cell organelles has changed. The first thing you notice is that the endoplasmatic reticulum has increased in size. And that is in the rough endoplasmatic reticulum, which contains a lot of ribosomes, which show up as many small dots in the electron microscope, and I copied that also here in the diagram. And these are the protein factories. Of course, they need more energy, and that is why there are more mitochondria. And the storage spaces of the Golgi apparatus are now available to store these proteins. The proteins that are produced there are, of course, the enamel matrix proteins, and because these cells are all close together, they become longer as their organelles in the plasma multiply more and more. And in three, the ameloblast has become really long, so it is particularly long in this situ situation. In addition to the many organelles that are active in the production and storage of the enamel matrix, it has now also created many small secretory granula. These contain enamel matrix that is not yet secreted by the cell, but it is just about to be secreted almost immediately. They are called granula because they appear as coarse grain dots in the electron microscope image. But it is still the pre-ameloblast. It is just about to, to secrete the enamel matrix that it has produced. For this purpose, it has a secretory end at 4a, which becomes pointed, and the secretory granula do collect there. And in the diagram on the left at a, you can see that this secreting ameloblast is now located at number 4, where dental enamel or enamel matrix is also deposited. In this region, the dental primordium is therefore in the process of producing enamel. And the many small black lines at the secretory end of the ameloblast in the diagram on the right, they indicate that the matrix is now also being enriched with crystals. 
So these are the hydroxyapatite crystals, the main component of the enamel when it is finished. But we are not finished yet. I should mention that the nucleus in the secreting ameloblast is usually, or quite often so, remote from the secretion end and, and at the basal end of the ameloblast. However, there are also ameloblasts that do exactly the same thing, but in these the cell nucleus is located exactly differently, which means closer to the secretion region, here at 4b. I don't know what this means or why this is the case. It is just what is observed and what is written in the textbooks. And there is something else that is very important to know. Enamel matrix is only secreted if a thin layer of dentin has already been formed underneath it. In fact, the odontoblasts and the ameloblasts communicate with each other. Like this, they say uh, the ameloblast indicates to the odontoblast that it is ready to produce enamel but only after the odonoblast will have deposited a thin layer of dentine. And that is exactly what happens. This secretory end of the secreting ameloblast is called Tome's process, and it is not just a secretory end of a glandular cell. No, the Tome's process contains not only matrix granula, but also endocytotic vesicles and phagosomes. In certain regions, it also shows strong folds in the cell membrane. And this structural peculiarity indicates that it is probably able to secrete matrix and reabsorb matrix at the same time. We have already said that the enamel matrix is produced and secreted in the first step, but then it has to be reabsorbed again and the many hydroxyapatite crystals are deposited in the course of this action at the same time. And the arrangement of the crystals depends on the structure of the matrix. The Tomes process also influences the structure of the matrix. This somehow all happens at the time when the ameloblast is in its maturity stage, which is referred to as 4. And 5a and 5b in the diagram show ameloblasts that now do only resorb matrix. The ameloblast is now at nearly as long as it was before, and instead of the secretory end, it now carries a resorbing, resorbing epithelium, which can be recognized by the multiply folded cell membrane at 5a. And however, a smooth cell membrane is also de described in the literature for this stage. This is shown at 5b, and it probably does not resorb any matrix. And when this has been achieved, I mean, when the enamel has been deposited in its full thickness as a matrix, and this matrix has then been re resorbed again and the crystals have been deposited, then the ameloblasts become inactive, which means they lose length again and then remain visible for a while as inactive ameloblasts sitting on top of the enamel, as you can see at number 6. But in the diagram on the left, you can also see at number 6 that the enamel epithelium also dissolves here. The cells perish. Only very few of these ameloblasts, which have already done so much in their life, will survive and then fulfill one last task. When the tooth actually and eventually emerges into the oral cavity, these surviving ameloblasts participate in the formation of the epithelial attachment. This is the first junctional epithelium of the gingiva. Details on this will come in the special lecture on the oral mucosa, where I will also talk in detail about the gingiva. So the ameloblasts really have a lot to do. And there is one more aspect I need to mention. I have, in the diagram, I have listed maturation stages four and five in sequence, which is first secretion, of the matrix and then resorption and storage of the crystals. But I need to clarify something here. It has long been assumed that the entire enamel matrix is first deposited in full thickness and only then does the ameloblast transform into a resorbing ameloblast. This would only be when it will have reached the enamel surface. This may be conceivable for the mouse in which the enamel is only a quarter of a millimeter thick 
that is only 250 micrometers. In humans, however, the enamel can be around 4 millimeters thick at its thickest point at the cusp. And nobody can tell me that the entire matrix is first completely deposited at this full thickness and then completely broken down again and interspersed with crystals. No, no amyloblast can fulfill all these tasks at the same time with an enamel thickness of 4 millimeters, or in other words, at a distance of 4 millimeters to the enamel dentine junction. It must be the case that maturation stages 4, which is secretion, and 5, which is resorption, occur one after the other repeatedly. I cannot imagine it any other way. And at the very least, the tomb's process must be said to have the property that it can do both at the same time, secret matrix and reabsorb the matrix, and also store the crystals. For this specific discussion, please refer to the textbooks for more details. Otherwise, we will get too much lost in details here. We have been working on dental enamel for decades, also together with our colleagues in San Francisco. Here is Pamela Den Besten with her senior assistant Wu Li in the left picture. And in the right picture, Pamela Den Besten is with us in Berlin. And together with Herbert Renz, we are analyzing hundreds of electron microscopical images of dental enamel. And in doing so, we also noticed that the pre secretory amyloblast is so much longer and then gets a little shorter again before it really starts to secrete the enamel matrix. Of course, we then also mentioned this in the publication we wrote together. Up to this point, we have seen how the amyloblast differentiates so that a secretory amyloblast has finally developed from the undifferentiated epithelial cells of the inner enamel epithelium. These amyloblasts then secrete an enamel matrix which is mineralized by the incorporation of hydroxyapatite crystals. The amyloblast takes over this task and somehow, at the same time, even if its matrix also precipitates. This matrix, what exactly it consists of, I will tell you in a moment. In this matrix, the proteins are arranged in such a way that they determine how the enamel crystals will then be arranged. At the tip of the amyloblast, there is a secretory zone and in addition, a gliding zone. The hydroxyapatite crystals are deposited fairly vertically, directly under the secretory area of the amyloblast tip. And there is also the, this gliding zone on each amyloblast where nothing is secreted. But because the amyloblast moves away from the matrix during deposition, it slides along the matrix with this gliding zone, which causes it to be slightly distorted. And this is where the hydroxyapatite crystals are deposited at an angle to the main axis, making the margin of the enamel prisms recognizable. In other words, a separate enamel prism is formed under each individual amyloblast and they can only be distinguished from each other structurally because the crystals at their margins have a different angle. These enamel prisms are called prism because at the time of their first description over 150 years ago, they probably resembled the prisms in crystals in some way. So today we know that they can also resemble a somewhat variable shape. In any case, they do not actually look like prisms in a crystal. You can see a little more in the diagram here. There are zones where the crystals, shown as these short thin black lines, have a denser arrangement in certain regions and in fact there is a rhythm in the secretion of the enamel matrix and its deposition of crystals. This rhythm is alternating between fast and slow. And you can actually see how much enamel is deposited per day. This is between 3 and 4 micrometers per day. And then there is a larger rhythm, as if the amyloblasts take a short break and then the matrix collapses a little bit and that way it makes a small kink. 
These are then really visible as growth lines at intervals of 8 to 10 micrometers. And they are also the so-called Retzius lines in the micrograph. We will come back to that later also. And on the right, you can see an electron microscopical image taken in transmission of the electrons. Um, there we see many small crystal needles. And for your orientation, the scale mark at the edge of the image on the right is 0.25 micrometers. This is a quarter of a micrometer. We have captured a prism margin here. You can see how the borderline runs vertically through the middle of the image. And on the left, the crystals run vertically. And on the right, they are shorter, which means they are sectioned and continue in other directions that are not within the section plane. Here you can see some experts in enamel matrix research visiting me in my office that was in 1995. You can see Anne Hoiseon, who is uh, working mainly on fish, and then Danny Deutsch, Colin Robinson and Henri Magloire. They are all professors, of course. And also in the picture there is Dr. Tonemann and also one of our students whose name I unfortunately cannot remember. She must be a doctor in the meantime, of course. In the following images, you can read the names of Colin Robinson and Danny Deutsch under the diagrams that I have redrawn for you on the basis of their publications. We have been talking about enamel matrix all the time now. What is that actually? Well, enamel matrix consists mainly of proteins and enzymes. In this case, it is uh, proteases which break down proteins. And you read the term amylogenins in the slide. What are they? This is a heterogeneous group of proteins which with a low molecular weight, this is 5 to 25 kilodeltons, if that tells you anything. And in humans, there are 175 amino acids that make up the amylogenins, and there are about 13 isoforms or modifications that have been described. And these amylogenins are very important for the incorporation of crystals. They assemble into a special three-dimensional matrix structure in which the small matrix secretion granula that have emerged from the ameloblast at the top of the picture and then join together to form larger spheres and conglomerates. These are still quite small, 20 nanometers, and are therefore called nanospheres and several nanospheres join together again to form larger structures, which are then 10 times larger. The enamel matrix is then mature and has formed a specific cavity framework into which the crystals can be pushed and laid down. At the same time, special enzymes were also secreted by the ameloblast proteases 1, which are precisely there to clump the nanospheres together and stabilize them. And other names for these proteases 1 are enamelosine or matrix metalloprotease 20, abbreviated MMP20. And in case you ever come across these terms. And the proteinase 2 was also secreted by the ameloblast. Other names for this are enamelserine protease or calicrane 4 or KLK4. And what do they do? Yes, exactly. Now the matrix has to be broken down again, which creates more space for the storage of further crystals. And they can now orient themselves to the other crystals that have been already deposited. And now the ameloblast resorbs all the matrix debris and pushes more and more crystals into the cavities until other several successive maturation phases, the enamel finally forms a crystalline structure that really consists of 98% hydroxy, uh, hydroxyapatite crystals. At this point, I would like to give you another clinical hint. Aminogenesis imperfecta. We have already seen a picture of this at the beginning of this lecture. Is it again, it is due to a defect in these processes that I have just mentioned. In other words, something is not working properly during matrix formation. To date, 
14 different mutations on the chromosome of the amylogenin gene have been linked to amylogenesis imperfecta. That enamel has then a disturbed prism structure and a rough and oftentimes porous surface. However, dentine is then formed normally. What is interesting, however, is the fact that within the same dental arch, so in the same person, some teeth can be affected by this amylogenesis imperfecta and others appear normal. So there is still a need for further research to clarify the question of how gene mutations affect individual teeth and not others. So now we have to imagine and maybe also understand how all the calcium and phosphate gets into the enamel matrix. Here at B I have sketched two possibilities. SI stands for stratum in the medium. That is another layer of epithelial cells as I briefly explained in the lecture on tooth development. Now calcium enters this stratum intermedium from the blood vessels of the tooth bell, of course. This is the only way I can imagine. And in the form of ions referred to here as two pluses. We are only looking at calcium here. It is probably representative of the other minerals that can also be found in the enamel. And now calcium can now be absorbed by the amyloblast as shown in the diagram on the right. The amyloblast will, with all its organelles, is shown on the left and the amyloblast on the right only shows the calcium transport. And this occurs on one hand by diffusion. This is the black arrows. And on the other hand, by active calcium transport with the sodium calcium pump, which is the red arrows. And then calcium is released into the enamel matrix, again by diffusion and by the uh, sodium calcium pump. And if you are now wondering, can the amyloblast even tolerate that amount of calcium that has to go into the enamel? As far as I understand, I can tell you that it is probably not that bad. There is only ever a certain amount of calcium in the amyloblast that it can tolerate. It's a bit like, for example, a piece of a garden hose filled with water. Regardless of whether you run a lot or a little water through it, so whether it runs through quickly or slowly, there is always the same amount of water in that specific section of the garden hose at a certain point of time. Isn't it so? So just as much as runs in at a certain point, the same amount runs out again, right? So the amyloblast is not poisoned by too much of calcium. And then there is the second possibility that calcium diffuses through the intercellular space, so not through the amyloblast at all. In this diagram, I have drawn the space between the amyloblast in the schematically enlarged form, otherwise I would have been able to label it or to see anything. So in reality, it is only a gap in the ranges of nanometers. Phosphate also takes the same route. So both paths for mineral transport are used and in the end, the finished mineralized enamel consists of 95% minerals by weight. And here in the diagram on the far right, I have schematically depicted the regions of enamel maturation. The term pre-eruptive enamel maturation describes a whole sequence of processes that turn that the only initially mineralized enamel matrix into a crystalline structure, which is then ultimately referred to as enamel. In detail, these are the growth of the enamel crystals and the compaction and thus the hardening of the crystalline structure and the associated selective change in the composition of the enamel matrix and the removal of water and, of course, the associated activity of the amyloblasts. It is them who have to do all this work. This has been investigated in non-erupted teeth of various experimental in animals, but also in humans, and with these findings, enamel maturation has been divided into four phases. Phase one is the secretion of the enamel matrix by the amyloblasts. The first small nuclei of the uh, enamel crystals are already visible at the distance of 0.05 to 0.1 micrometers from the amyloblast. 
and in phase 2 the matrix proteins are replaced by water, which is tissue fluid from the environment, and also the mineral content of calcium and phosphate increases. And in phase 3, almost the entire matrix is reabsorbed, and the resulting cavities are initially filled with water, and the calcium content is initially only 35%, and the phosphate content is only 17%, and the enamel is therefore still quite porous. And in phase 4, these pores are then closed by mineralizing them to the maximum. All phases start in the incisal region or at the cusp and spread out centrifugally and in a cervical direction. And this means that the incisal and cusp near enamel parts reach the state of mature enamel first and the cervical regions of the tooth only later. In the diagram, 10 at the cusp is the highest degree of mineralization and 1 is at the tooth neck cervical region where mineralization is not yet as advanced. Danny Deutsch has examined these local differences in the composition of the enamel matrix in relation to the calcium and phosphate contents in more detail. At A, this is the labial surface of an incisor in the ninth month of development and the regions 1 to 7 are drawn in which can then be found again at B in the diagram and at the top of the diagram at 1, the mineral content, which is here phosphate and calcium, is lower at 6 and 7, at the bottom of the diagram, and this is the incisal edge. And at the bottom at C, D and E, the compositions of the proteins of the enamel matrix in region 3, 5 and 7 are also shown. You will have to take another look at the details in the book. So now it is about the enamel prisms, which is another larger chapter. In this sequence of images you can see from left to right enamel samples at various magnifications. On the far left, this is a transmission electron microscopic image at A. This is a very thin section through a fetal enamel surface. We have already seen this earlier in the lecture as a scanning electron micrograph. And this section comes from this very specimen. That is why the electron-dense black line can be seen directly under A. This is the cut of the gold-spotted layer, which we always have to apply to the scanning electron microscopical specimens to dissipate the uh, excess electrons. Under this black line, which represents the current enamel matrix surface, we can now see the enamel matrix clearly brighter. But at a distance of less than half a micrometer, we see such dark electron-dense areas, more and more of them towards the bottom right. These are the first mineral condensations in the newly deposited enamel matrix. This is now a fetus from the sixth month. And at B, this is also another transmission electron microscopical image of somewhat more mature enamel. Um, where we can see the individual crystals, such elongated structures. In the left two-thirds of this image, B, they run more longitudinal from top to bottom, and in the right third you can see how they abruptly change their direction. This is an important observation, because from the diagrams of the ameloblast, the enamel matrix and the embedded crystals, we can see at the edge how the crystals take on a different direction. This can also be seen very clearly here in this uh, transmission electron microscope image. And here at C, we see the crystallize, but now in a scanning electron microscopic image. The specimen was first ground smooth and then etched for 30 seconds uh, with the 35% phosphoric acid. And then we actually see the structures in two orders of magnitude. The small structures, these are the crystals, arranged in the shape of needles. And if you squint your eyes a little bit, you can no longer see the individual crystal needles. Instead, you can see a coarser structure, which then can also be recognized in the rightmost image at D. And this is the same specimen, but taken from a slightly greater distance. So. What you see now, that's the enamel prisms. 
Each ameloblast leaves the enamel matrix underneath it and the crystals are arranged in it as we have described. And in the center they lie lengthwise and at the edge more obliquely or transversely. And these enamel prisms are thus recognizable as the metastructure of the arrangement of the crystals if you look at them from further away, which is at a lower magnification. The enamel prisms are therefore ultimately the petrified image of the ameloblast movements, and this is typical of dental enamel. What do these prisms look like? As I said previously, the term is somewhat misleading. They are not actually prisms. The term comes from crystal chemistry, and in real crystals, the structures are really geometric, like prisms. Enamel, however, is a product of cells, so there we are going to expect more variations of shapes. You can find various outline shapes in the textbooks, typically mostly those like here at B. I have found so-called typical prism shapes referred to as keyhole type. And this is what keyholes used to look like some time ago. So at S you can see the prism itself and at B the prism beard, similar to the beard of an old key. And because this is an image of a fetal enamel surface, you can also see the sliding zone. And that is the area in which the prisms is sitting in the matrix at an angle and the matrix slides past it during its own secretion. And here the matrix is smeared a little and the crystals are made to lie at an angle, which is why the prism boundaries can be recognized at all. We also find this typical outline shape in the transmission electron microscope section in the uh, right hand image, in the group at A and at B where we can once again see the different directions of the crystals in the prisms, otherwise we would not be able to recognize the boundaries. And on the far right, this is an optical section obtained by means of a confocal laser scanning microscope. The prism boundaries light up and here they are no longer typical keyholes in all cases. There are also other shapes and we can you see even more irregular shapes in the leftmost image. And at A, this is the another surface of the tooth that is still forming and we have removed the ameloblast and are looking at the impressions of the ameloblast processes in the still soft enamel matrix. And there are, we see very variable shapes. A few keyholes, but also horseshoe shaped outlines and then oval and even round outlines and at the right edge of the image we also see pentagonal and hexagonal outlines. That one would fit the term prism after all. <laughs> so what does a real typical prism look like? Or there are so many different ones to be found in enamel. We examined this more closely and found that these seem to be optical phenomena depending on the direction from which you look at the matrix surface in the scaling electron microscope. We have modeled individual prisms from uh, Play-Doh in different colors and the enamel matrix is in this model is made of plaster so this fits together like this. So here are the tombs processes and their corresponding impressions in the fresh matrix. And if you look at this model of the fetal enamel surface from different angles we always see slightly different outlines. This is a really difficult geometric and optical phenomenon. We have also produced another model here, which is actually a very typical keyhole type of prism. But if I tilt it a little, I hope you can see this in the camera, then it changes its shape. I can even recognize a hexagonal outline shape when the angle of view changes. We only modeled these models after the images we saw in the scanning electron microscope. And this technique is also full of optical artifacts. So what exactly does this really look? I'm afraid to say that still remains a bit of a mystery. We wanted to know a little more about it. And Dr. Herbert Renz meticulously assembled thousands of optical outlines from the confocal laser scanning microscope into 3D. So into this 3D reconstruction, there are six prisms 
whose outlines were then able to be traced. Uh, the first thing you notice is that the prisms, I call them prisms, they have a quite an irregular contours, really not like and here and there thicker and then in between even here and there they are thinner. This seems to be a result of a secretion process of the enamel matrix which is soft and therefore perhaps not uniform. And then at one we see a beautiful keyhole type, many different other shapes and then at six a horseshoe type which has no prism beard. So the prism outlines can be somewhat variable but let us return to the schematic idealized and even hypothetical representation that you will find in many textbooks for a while. I will only touch on this briefly here. You will have to read the details again in the book to fully understand the diagram. At A you will find the idealized hexagonal outlines and at 1 in light red I have drawn in a prism of a keyhole type and at B you can see what I would like uh, in a perpendicular section, a vertical B. And A, it is the ameloblast. TP, it is projection, the tomb's process, and the lowercase letters indicate A, the gliding zone, which does not secrete, and the secretory surfaces, which would correspond to the cross section of the prism rod in B, and the curved base C, and then the free retracted ameloblast surface D. So, in case this is a bit confusing, See the book for the details. And on the far right side you can see very clearly at the first glance how the crystals run lengthwise in the prism but at an angle at the edge. However, this area belongs to the prism, although some authors refer this area to an interprism, something like an interprismatic substance. And the boundary between neighboring prisms is always, sometimes, often referred to as the prism sheath. Yes, there is indeed a thin, crystal-free area there, but it still remains a bit confusing. And here is a beautiful model that I inherited from my predecessor uh, in the chair, Professor Hans Lenz. He had already modeled these beautiful, typical keyhole prisms in different colors out of plastic and glued them all together. And then he cut the surfaces of this block at different angles. And what do we see? The outlines of the prisms look very much distorted, depending on the angle of the section plane. Narrow, slender or flat, squat. So how do you know what angle you have hit the prisms in a real preparation of dental enamel? I can tell you that a number of publications have already appeared in which the enamel prisms of different species or prehominids have been compared with each other and conclusions were drawn on the basis of the prism shapes in the section alone as to which specimens are more related to each other than others and so on. With what we see here I can only say pretty risky and quite speculative as long as you don't know the orientation of the section plane. Dental enamel has a very interesting and perhaps still puzzling internal structure. But I also wanted to draw conclusions from the arrangement of the enamel prisms as to how a tooth crown is formed in the first place. So I examined tooth enamel under scanning electron microscope as much as I could. I would like to show you the most important findings I saw here in this lecture. So we processed enamel samples in such a way that I was able to follow the prisms on their way all the way from the dentino enamel junction to the uh, enamel surface without any gaps in the scanning electron microscope. In ground sections and in fractured specimens. And then we took lots of individual photos back then still in the dark room on letter sized paper and I laid them all out on the floor of the hallway and glued them together and crawled around on the all fours and was delighted to perceive what I could see. Here we have arrived at the enamel surface and we can see the cores of the prisms in the fractured specimen in the lower half of the picture and we are looking at the enamel surface in the same picture. 
that we can see the many indentations. These are the last impressions that the ameloblasts have left on the enamel surface with their tomb's processes. And the prisms and the fractured part show the path taken by the ameloblasts while they were forming them. And we can also see that not all prisms end directly at the surface with an indentation, which we will see in more detail in the following slide. So here, in the left picture, a fractured preparation in which all prisms reach the surface, and on the right side, the impressions of the ameloblast can still be seen in many places, but there are other areas which are free of such impressions, especially at the top right of the picture. And here, the prisms end about 10 micrometers below the enamel surface. So there is a layer of prism-free enamel. This is, of course, clinically important. The enamel etching technique is based on exposing the enamel prisms, as, we, as can be seen in the picture on the left. And this is done with phosphoric acid, 35% for 30 seconds. And in the picture on the right, I'm etching the enamel in order to be able to bond brackets or attachments for the aligner treatment in orthodontics. And if there are some regions on the enamel surface where the prisms do not reach the enamel surface, then this technique does not work. This is more likely to occur with deciduous teeth, more seldomly with permanent teeth. The comparison with an onion is not quite correct, but perhaps it will help you to visualize it. Enamel develops layer by layer. Rough layers can be seen here in the fractured specimen on the left. And on the right, there is a, uh, an etched ground specimen, which also shows special growth lines, the neonatal line. This means that at the time of birth, this tooth was as fully formed as the line between the two red arrows shows. And the ameloblasts have taken a break because maybe perhaps the change in nutritional supply in connection with the birth that uh, also has reached them. And then uh, the matrix may have sagged a little bit as it was still soft and then the enamel formation continued. But we can still see the small kink along the line in the enamel prisms. Not as clearly as the neonatal line, but we see these growth lines throughout the enamel. However, although the value of 4 micrometers per day is often given for a regular average rate of enamel formation, the rate of enamel formation is not constant, actually. So, during the first three months of enamel formation, a rate of less than 3 micrometers is observed, and after 10 months, then there is a rate of more than 4 micrometers per day. And there is also different in different regions of dental enamel. In any case, you can see the growth lines of the enamel quite well in this ground section. And ultimately, these are snapshots of the respective states during continuous tooth development and the respective enamel surfaces at the time when the ameloblasts all took a short break and then continued. At least, that is how I can imagine it. These lines always show a somewhat denser mineralization. And here in the confocal laser scanning microscope, you can see clear growth lines in the white arrows. And these are the Retius lines, named after the anatomist Anders Retius. The distance between these lines can be very different, varying between 4 and 150 micrometers. We wanted to follow these lines over the entire enamel area in many of those ground sections, but that did not work out well. There were areas where we simply could not see them and follow them. So I don't know if they were really gone, or at least there are optical phenomena. And here in the picture, we can see even more. Between these retius lines, there are even smaller sections that indicate a rhythm in the formation of enamel. With this little sketch, I just want to show you how the incremental lines come about. Uh, I've already shown here the uh, dentine core, and in blue I will just add the first layer of enamel as it maybe starts at the cusp tips. And then it goes layer by layer, and 
if we go on like this, there is one layer which connects both of the cusps. From now on, the cusps can no longer move apart any further. And now it goes on, and let's say this would be the final layer where the immunoblasts have reached the cusp tips, let's say that. And uh, then it only goes on at the lateral part, which is towards the cervical region, where they add on layers like this, and like this. And these are the uh, incremental lines, which can be also seen at the surface. And we will address them as resistance lines. And I will go into the details now in the next part of this lecture. And these growth lines, these incremental lines that we have just seen were schematically the resistance lines. And then they reach the enamel surface, which is always the case cervically at the tooth crown. And they are then called the perichymata or perichymata. There are different ways to express them. And these are the grooves that run horizontally around the crown and the, of the tooth. And they are 30 to 100 micrometers apart. So in young people, you can even see them with the naked eye in good light. We can also say perichymata are retinous lines that reach the enamel surface. And between these furrows, you can also see the many small indentations, which are the impressions that the ameloblasts have left on the enamel surface. There are some other interesting structural features in dental enamel. The retinous lines, which we have just seen, are marked here in this etched ground section with a red arrow. And on the right of the section, we can see these lighter and darker zones indicated by these two adjacent arrows. These are known as the hunter schrager bands. These zones, light and dark, alternate, and they are mainly found in the middle third of the cuspal area. Now, what are these light and dark stripes? There is a doctoral thesis by Gustav Preiswerk from 1895, who described these light and dark zones as para and dia zones. These are groups of longitudinally sectioned prisms in the light areas and groups of transversely cut prisms in the dark stripes. We can still confirm this here in the scanning electron microscope more than 100 years later. Groups of prisms are being captured longitudinally and transversely. And this provides clues to the arrangement of the prisms in the enamel. And that is another chapter in itself. One of my first topics as a young assistant in anatomy was the question of the arrangement of prisms in tooth enamel. It is now 40 years since I dealt with this, and I'm really pleased that I can still present the knowledge um, I gained so long ago to you today in this lecture. It is not just about the arrangement of the prisms in the enamel, but also about the diameter of the prisms, and this is all connected in certain ways. In some textbooks, and I've chosen not to mention the source here of courtesy, because it is indeed really wrong. You can find illustrations that assume that the diameter of the prisms must increase towards the outside. Otherwise, the volume of the enamel crown cannot be filled. We assume that each prism is formed by its own ameloblast and that each ameloblast starts at the dentino enamel junction and moves up to the enamel surface. And if the prisms then become thicker towards the surface, the ameloblasts should also increase in size. But is this really the case? I said earlier that we took an endless number of scanning electron micrographs of dental enamel and pasted together tracings on which we could follow the prisms from the dentino enamel junction up to the enamel surface. I then crawled around on the floor of the anatomy corridors on the glued together photos with a ruler in my hand and measured the prisms, thousands of them. And here we see that the prisms are not exactly the same thickness everywhere, but show such small local variations in their diameter as we saw earlier. 
But this graph shows, as an example, that the diameter D does not increase on the way from the dentino enamel junction DAJ to the enamel surface ES. But the diameter measurements range around 6 micrometers. So how is it possible for prisms with a constant diameter to fill the volume of the enamel mantle, which continues to increase towards the periphery? I can present you with a few hypotheses for this, and the question is already very old, that take a look at the possible explanations. And the ratio of the inner surface to the outer surface of the enamel mantle is about uh, between 1 to 1.27 and 1 to 1.8, which I have compl compiled from the literature. And then let's take a typical segment from the enamel mantle, which I have drawn here in red. And this should serve as an example for many other segments that we uh, could use with a slightly different proportions for the other areas of the enamel crown. And to start with, let's stick to the surface, and that's interesting enough. Yeah, here it is. This is just a section of enamel, and I just entered the uh, enamel rods as some people assume that they get any thicker. But this is maybe not the case, because the amyloblasts don't get any thicker. So there were other people who would say, well, this may be easy. There is this so-called interprismatic substance, which increases in... Uh, uh, volume and maybe even in diameter. So this will contribute to the increase of the surface of the enamel crown. Um, other people will say, well, it's also not the case. They had another idea. So I uh, maybe just um, make another section of enamel to it like here. And they said it is that we have some prisms sort of stacked in between. So we have the normal prism here, and there's another prism that is stacked in between, and then this ne neighboring prism runs like this, and so and so. So the question is, if we have any prisms all of a sudden stacked in between, where do they come from? Are there any amyloblasts that divide? I have never seen any amyloblasts um, dividing. And then <laughs> another possibility is that they said, well, I mean, you can find it all in literature, that they said um, ah, it must be that some of the enamel rods are branching off. So let me try to sketch a branched off enamel rod like here. Okay, this is a branching of an enamel rod. This is another question. How should this be possible? Um, how, how is it related to the amyloblast that way? And then there is a, a even further possibility. Uh, let me try to bring it also on the blackboard. Um, there is a possibility that the uh, enamel rods don't run straight and maybe also are not sort of branching off or somewhere stacked in between, but there is the possibility that the enamel rods sort of run in a wavy path. And this wavy path I will explain to you in more detail. For me, this seems to be the uh, possible explanation how everything fits together. We have just sketched on the blackboard. Here again is a more beautiful diagram now. So the increase in prism diameter was actually assumed in many publications, not only more than a hundred years ago, but also towards the end of the last century. And yes, and the interprismatic substance cannot serve as something like a filling mass between the prisms because however the margin of the prisms may be structured, we have seen the more oblique arrangement of the crystals at the margin of the prisms. The margin itself belongs to the prism and is produced by the amyloblast. There is no such thing like an interprismatic substance between the prisms. Everything we see there is part of the prism. Just as the skin on the milk, if the glass is left there for a long time, it is part of the milk, isn't it? So even if Wilhelm Meyer was already of the opinion in 1932 that the prisms themselves cannot increase in diameter that much, his explanation with the interprismatic substance unfortunately does not help any further here. If one assumes as the long literature list and the third hypothesis shows that some new prisms are inserted between the enamel where it has more volume, 
then the ameloblast must also be able to divide, as I mentioned when I did draw it on this blackboard. Or where else would new ameloblasts for new prisms come from? But nobody has ever seen an ameloblast once it has differentiated as such that it can still divide. So that is not a solution to our problem either. And what should we make of Dr. Mummery's explanation? He said that there are that there must be branched prisms. He even claimed to see them here in the ground section. And if you look closely, you can also see prisms that appear to be newly inserted between them. But I think it's clear what we are seeing here. These are artifacts of an only two-dimensional representation of a spatial problem. Here, prisms run in and out of the section plane, and we actually know this is quite clearly today. And yes, and uh, we can see what else there is here in the diagram at E, that the prisms are not straight. Jeff Osborne has already shown this, but we still have to investigate the question of whether the wavy course of the prisms can really fill the volume of the enamel mantle. And let us stay with the graphical simplification again and draw some prisms onto our typical enamel segment, which maintain a constant diameter, but become increasingly wavy towards the surface. The actual diameter remains the same, but due to the inclined or oblique position, they also arrive at a surface um, at an angle, and the effective diameter therefore must increase. This then corresponds to the incorrect assumption that I have drawn in red with the one prism, which becomes thicker and would run straight. We were even able to uh, verify this with data from the literature. There is a paper by Fossey and co-workers from 1968, where they sectioned through the enamel from the outside to the dentino enamel junction and identified the prism outlines at the individual ground sections. And starting from the respective prism centers, they measured the distances from prism to prism and concluded that the prisms at the periphery must have a larger diameter because their centers had greater distances from each other. Unfortunately, they missed the fact that they measured more obliquely sectioned prisms in the thicker enamel on the outside, and only near the uh, dentune enamel junction did the section outlines correspond more to the true diameters. So the finding, the measurement results, were correct. But the conclusion that the prism thickness had increased, that was wrong. Let us take another look at those chimney-like preparations that I have made from the uh, dentune enamel junction to the enamel surface. They are prepared in such a way that the walls are also perpendicular to each other. And after etching with phosphoric acid, we can see the cores of the prisms. At C, near the then to new enamel junction, the prisms are preferably vertical in both planes. And at B, which is now further up towards the surface, uh, we see more prism outlines in one plane and matching oblique prism orientations in the plane perpendicular to it. That makes it clear to me. The inclination of the prism increases in thicker enamel. And however, the prisms are not simply increasingly curved or inclined but we have seen a waved course in Jeff Osborne's papers, and the hunter schrieger bands also show prisms that run wavy against each other in groups. So, in the right half of the sketch of the tooth crown, uh, if you assume that the prisms only run straight and stretched in the thin enamel on the tooth cervical region, and then when the enamel becomes thicker, their inclination increases. And in the very thick enamel at the cusp, they run back and forth, wavy with increasing inclination. And at the very top of the cusp, it looks like they are stretched, but they are par particularly slanted here. And on the left, I have drawn the so-called isogons, which are imaginary lines along which the prisms should have a similar inclination. You can also say, the thicker the enamel, the more oblique the prisms. Or to put it more mathematically, 
the inclination is a function of the enamel thickness, or even better, a function of the distance from the dentino enamel junction. We can demonstrate this very well on the enamel surface. When measuring thousands of prisms, we noticed that the angle at which they reach the enamel surface is also a function of the thickness of enamel. Or it also depends on the region of their arrival. In the cervical region of the tooth at D, they are preferably vertical towards the surface and towards the cusp they end up at an increasingly oblique angle on the surface until they reach the greatest inclination at A on the cusp. And this can be up to 70 degrees as I measured it. The ge geometric relationship is shown again in the diagram on the right. The prism P has an actual diameter A, but the effective prism diameter B depends on the angle alpha uh, with which the prism reaches the uh, surface, enamel surface ES. And this finding even has clinical significance. There are these notch-shaped um, defects in the cervical region. I am not referring to the wedge-shaped defects that are ground into the transition between the crown and root by incorrect horizontal toothbrushing. These notch-shaped defects, as the scanning electron microscopical um, images sh are showing, they correspond pretty much exactly to the almost straight prism arrangement in the cervical region. This leads to the suspicion that the prisms are blown out or cracked out when the tooth is bent or incorrect loading in such a way that the enamel is blown out where it is very thin and where the enamel prisms run straight and parallel to each other. The colored image in the middle shows a traumatic contact of the cusp, which is the red arrow, and a notch-shaped defect with the white arrow, and in the cervical region of the crown. To conclude this long chapter on dental enamel, I would like to tell you about the now almost classic experiment we did with the spaghetti in a coffee filter. That was one of my first scientific lectures at the annual conference for basic research in January 1987 and I remember that some of the older people found it a bit strange when I used spaghetti, which also they have a constant diameter to illustrate the structural elements of dental enamel with a constant diameter. And the coffee filter? This is what my mother's coffee filter looked like. Small volume at the bottom and large volume at the top. A paper filter back goes in and then coffee powder, then boiling water and the so-called filter coffee drips out of the bottom. I have given this explanation of the function of this coffee filter for those who only know espresso machines. In any case, this coffee filter represents a typical volume segment of the enamel mantle for, for us. Smaller volume at the bottom, clearly increasing volume at the top. And now the spaghetti are inserted. And we see that with their elongated shape, these structural elements with their constant diameter can perhaps fill the volume at the dentino enamel junction, which is at the bottom of the filter. But towards the top, they are increasingly large gaps between the spaghetti. Do you remember, Wilhelm Meyer wanted to fill these gaps with the interprismatic substance. Dr. Dewey with the new prisms inserted between them and Dr. Mamri with its, his branched prisms. And now let's put the coffee filter with the spaghetti in it in a boiling water and see how long it takes for the spaghetti to soften if you want seven minutes that they have now uh, because they are now soft taken on a wavy shape and then they can also completely fill the volume of the coffee filter and the filter was specially chosen to be transparent so that we can see the wavy shape very clearly and this also corresponds pretty much exactly to our findings on the course of the enamel prisms. In this way, I have better understood some of the enamel structure and the course of the prisms inside of the enamel. But what I have not really understood yet is the question of exactly how the ameloblasts are doing this. In other words, who or how is it controlled 
that the ameloblasts move in such a way that this wavy course with the peripherally increasing oblique position actually results. And what is the motor for the movement of the ameloblasts? Do they push themselves upwards on their exuded matrix or are they pushed upwards by all the neighboring cells of their inner enamel epithelium? So, as you can see, there are still so many unanswered questions. The take-home message. We have looked closely at the ameloblasts and seen that they reach different stages of maturity inside the tooth belt. And when they then secrete the matrix, they produce the enamel prisms as the petrified image of their own movement. Although we don't really know how this movement comes about. We took a closer look at the matrix itself and then at the possible prism shapes, which are either very variable or not yet known in detail. And then some structural elements of the enamel, the growth lines and the pericomata and the geometric relationships, how the prisms, if they have a constant diameter, can still fill the volume of the enamel crown. This is what the spaghetti in the coffee filter showed us. And with this, I thank you for your kind attention.